Hey folks, Happy New Year. So today what I wanted to talk about was the baggage we take when we use allegory and metaphor to communicate ideas in stories. And to explain what I mean, I'm going to be using three seemingly straightforward children's stories about talking animals. I'm going to interpret their message, I'm going to explain to you what they have to say, and then I'm going to explain to you how they're problematic. Then I'm going to wrap things up with a conclusion, and then a short video of a duck. Also, there's going to be an awkward ad segue, but it's going to be early in the video. Sound good? Good. Alright. So, in 2010, animation studio Aijudo Animation Works released You Are Umasu, a film based on a popular series of Japanese picture books of the same name. Set during the late Cretaceous period, the story mainly centers around Heart, a Tyrannosaurus Rex raised by herbivores after being left abandoned as an egg. Hart, along with his adoptive sibling Light, spends much of his childhood in relative comfort, living off of berries in a mostly predator-free environment. All of this much to the behest of the village elders, who insist he'll grow up to be a bloodthirsty big jaw. It's this question the story mainly lingers with. Can Hart live in peace among his adoptive family, or is he doomed to be the monster he was apparently born to become? <laughs> With the chance encounter of one of his own kind and the accidental discovery of his own taste for flesh, Hart runs away from home, making the decision to stop living the false life of a herbivore and give in to his natural predatory life. His first step is clear. Signing up to Skillshare, this video's sponsor. And an online learning community offering educational classes to millions of users. Hart knows better than anyone that Skillshare offers thousands of classes in a variety of subjects. Wow. Teaching anything from design to illustration and most importantly, productivity and lifestyle courses. Something a large extinct reptile could certainly find handy. Lucky for Hart, Skillshare is more affordable than ever with an annual subscription of less than 10 bucks a month and two free months of Skillshare Premium, clicking the link in this video's description. Personally, I'm a big fan of Nikki Stevens' classes on creative video storytelling and editing. Wow. wow! Whoever it is you're looking for, make 2020 a year where you explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity with Skillshare. Anyway, we come to find the village's elders were seemingly right all along. Hart's grown up to be yet another cold, ruthless meat eater. And in the context of the story, it definitely makes sense that he'd go this route. Hart's essentially grown up being told there are only two options in his world. To be a kind and peaceful herbivore, or an unfeeling, bloodthirsty carnivore. So, realising he physically can't be a herbivore, he feels obligated not just to switch up his diet, but take on all the behaviours and characteristics that come along with being a meat eater. All of this until he meets Umasu, an orphan plant eater. <laughs> Hart's forced to grapple with the reality that a lot of the behaviours he felt obligated to take on board just don't correlate to how he was raised and how he wants to act. He cares for Umasu, doesn't want to see the kid get hurt, and eventually takes him on as a kind of adoptive protege. Try as he might, Hart can't help being a kind, decent being. Things he didn't think he could be after he gave up life among herbivores. And things finally come full circle, with a natural disaster forcing Hart to head through rival territory to keep his old family safe, ultimately protecting them from the fearsome, domineering Baku. Things settle down and we get our conclusion, the straightforward moral of this story. Hart realises that he doesn't need to give up being who he is just because of the way he was born. <laughs> Wait, what was that? Okay. So, You Are Umasu is a really sweet, wonderful film that I'd highly recommend to anyone of any age group. 
It's also an excellent first case study into what I mean when I talk about the baggage of metaphors. So the story is pretty transparently one about tolerance and judgement, and I'd go so far as to say it's specifically one about racism. I mean, in literal terms, it's about how different characters are treated and the assumptions made about them based on their race, and how the false assumptions Hart's village made about him ultimately caused harm and conflict. I could also see the argument that the story says some things about disability, specifically in how Hart is born with a genetic condition, him being a carnivore, and his loved ones try to deny that rather than simply accepting him for who he is. I guess in theory it could be about the assumptions we make about genders and sexualities, but wherever we go with, following the ideas from beginning to end eventually forces us to make a choice. Is this a story about animals? or a story about people. Obviously, the film quickly makes it apparent that it isn't really about either. The cast is literally a bunch of animals, but they also clearly think and behave in ways that no animal would ever do. A carnivore is not going to decide to take a prey animal under its wing because it reminds them of their own childhood experiences, and generally they're not going to live haunted by the ghosts of their past. Really, applying any morality to the life of a wild, obligate carnivore would be a pretty bizarre thing to do. Others could disagree on this, but I'd say it's weird to prescribe value judgments like good or bad onto any action an animal has no real choice over. It doesn't make a lion, like, a bad person for eating meat. And I'd say on some level this is coded in the language of cinema itself, with evil predators in fiction usually being characterised that way because they seem to choose to revel in the torture and suffering of their prey, rather than just the act of eating meat itself. All of these kinds of deeper moral conundrums are pretty persony things, and I think most viewers can intuitively understand that animal characters are written this way more for the audience than to appeal to any moral truths about, like, being a dinosaur. Yet suddenly, at the end of this story, we're faced with a new moral truth. That, of course, Hart doesn't have to choose to be cruel or evil just because of how he was born. But also, obviously, his kind and his family's kind can't really live together, because he is predator and they are prey. So, like, what's that really telling us as a message? Is the moral of this story now about how there are still deep-rooted genetic truths about different groups? That some people just can't get along because that's the way they were born and that can't be changed? This is something I think makes obvious sense for a story about animals, because that's true about animals, especially predator and prey. I've never met a Tyrannosaurus rex and I'm sure we'd get along fine, but I'd say the innate behavioural differences between them and something like this is pretty different from a white person compared to a non-white person. Or for that matter, a straight person versus a gay person, or a man versus a woman. There is no inherent, biologically necessary antagonistic relationship the way there is for a carnivore versus a herbivore. And if you actually stick with the analogy, you're very quickly going to run into some pretty misguided pseudoscientific truths. Just look at the shape of their skulls. Compare and contrast to something like, say, the fox and the hound, which similarly uses animal metaphors as a way to talk about bigotry and intolerance without getting muddled in ideas of innate genetic differences between species. Todd and Copper are tragically separated by nature of how they were born, and are forced to live very different lives because of it. But the story here goes out of its way to show this is only the result of how humans choose to treat them, nothing to do with some innate differences between dogs and foxes. Also, to be clear, I'm only talking about the Disney movie here, I haven't read the original book, and when I read the summary, I didn't want to. Please don't read the summary of the original book. For my money, I don't think Yorimasu is really trying to spread any message about how different groups of people just can't get along and must be kept separate. What we have here is really just a pitfall of taking complicated human issues and imprinting them onto symbolic figures. For another example of this, see the ways magical beings are often used as allegories for marginalised groups in fantasy series like The Witcher. I think the lady's grown tired of your company. 
Lady? What lady? See her ears? She elf. And everyone knows elves are always doing something on the sly. Again, these metaphors help simplify what can otherwise be seen as serious, complicated topics into something easier for wide audiences to consume and consider. But also, metaphors like this bring on board some uncomfortable lines of logic that can wind up reinforcing prejudices as much as they break them down. For the worst possible execution of this, see Bright a movie that casts orcs as pseudo-black people, who are discriminated against not as a result of constant political scapegoating and the lingering effects of colonialism like in the real world, but because the orcs used to fight for the Dark Lord. <sighs> so there's Yorumasu, a story about empathy, understanding, and maybe also about ethnostates depending on how far you're willing to read into it. And if we want to keep looking into allegories in fiction that get very messy very quickly the more you read into them, I think we all know what our second example is going to be. I feel like it's impossible to talk about troubling animal-human racism metaphors and not talk about Zootopia, which I'm sure has been ringing through the heads of most viewers' heads up to this point in the video. 2016 Zootopia is a movie that also uses the predator-prey dynamic in a similar way to Yorimasu, mostly as a way to discuss bigotry and the assumptions we make about other groups of people. The film tells the story of a small-town rabbit girl named Judy who wants to hop into the rough-and-tumble world of being a big city cop. As you can probably guess, Judy being born a diminutive herbivore immediately puts her at odds with the other cadets, in some not-so-subtle nods to institutional sexism. So are all rabbits bad drivers, or is it just you? <laughs> Though this winds up being helpful in several unforeseen ways. It's a pretty smart and straightforward allegory that can be taken to its logical endpoint without leading us into too many problems. Aside from maybe the weird lapse in logic that it's apparently weird to have small animals be police officers in a city with an entire district for small animals. Ding! I'd also say it maybe buys too much into the idea that gender discrimination in the police force was entirely the result of men just recognising that women are on average biologically weaker. This isn't and was never really the case. That was more just an excuse for more irrational prejudices that already existed. For the most part though, I think it's an analogy that works. The same can't really be said for the pretty obvious nods the film makes towards racial profiling and discrimination, with the relationship shown between predator animals and prey. We reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. As the film explains, in the civilized future of Zootopia, meat and plant eaters can now live in relative harmony, though some rational paranoia still remains from the long history of brutality at the hands of predators until the present day. If your red flag alarm isn't going off right now, it might be broken. Basically, take the criticism I just made about how Zootopia misguidedly characterizes sexism in the police force as something based on sensible biological truths rather than more rational bigotries, and multiply that by a thousand. Much like Yoromasu, the predator-prey racism allegory is one that only really works if you don't think about it too much. Which is unfortunate because unlike Umasu, Zootopia really, really, really wants you to think about it. Once Judy enters the police force, this racial divide becomes the entire centerpiece of the narrative with her slowly bonding with the affable fox Nick Wilde as they uncover a secret conspiracy to demonise the predator minority. It turns out Assistant Mayor Bellwether is a prey supremacist who's trying to trick the public into thinking predator animals can be dangerous. So once again, this story is forced to grapple with a difficult contradiction layering a metaphor for a decidedly unfair and irrational form of bigotry onto what's actually a pretty valid and reasonable divide. In other words, the message of the film is clearly about how it's wrong to discriminate against predators simply for the way they were born. Except, even within the film's own lore, it would make sense to discriminate against predators because they're predators. Zootopia is another really fun and enjoyable movie with a generally positive message, even if Judy Hopps winds up being the kind of ruthless maverick cop that'd make even Dirty Harry blush. 
Actually, it's your word against yours. And if you want this pen, you're going to help me find this poor missing otter, or the only place you'll be selling popsicles is the prison cafeteria. Rabbit, I did what you asked. You can't keep me on the hook forever. So can you run the plate or not? Hey. The thing is, you don't need a warrant if you have probable cause, and I'm pretty sure I saw a shifty lowlife climbing the fence. And I ain't talking, Rabbit. And ain't nothing you can do to make me. Ice this weasel. What? All right, all right, please. I'll talk. I'll talk. More on that next time. But how much more directly it tries to tackle specific social issues winds up making its problems way more apparent. It's a story that is very clearly trying to draw parallels between the rampant discrimination against racial minorities, especially in the US, and the paranoia of helpless prey against obligate carnivores. Ultimately, it's hard to ignore the fact that a team of almost entirely white writers got together and put out a story that characterizes the white people stand-ins as defenseless prey animals, and the black people stand-ins as reformed but still inherently violent bloodthirsty savages. Now, I do want to stress that the film goes out of its way to contextualize its setting as a world where predators can get by entirely without consuming prey, and apparently in this movie's universe, there isn't anything innate to the behavior of a predator animal that would make them bloodthirsty or savage. That's right, lads. It's the Thermian, Thermian argument. argument. And in all honesty, I can see the thought process that can lead to all of this working. Essentially a statement about how even if the backward scientific racism views of the past were correct, of there being a deep set primal distinction between the civilized races and the savages, this still wouldn't justify prejudice and discrimination in the modern day. The trouble is, those views aren't correct and them being perpetuated here forces us to reconsider the same question we were left with in You Are Umasu. When are we talking about animals, and when are we talking about people? Each story ultimately comes to opposite conclusions. You Are Umasu suggests that were people genetically distinct in the same ways wild animals are, it would make sense to discriminate between them, while Zootopia tells us that we should still work around it. But are these stories suggesting groups of people are distinct in this way? Again, I'd say the answer to both is probably no, especially not with Zootopia. But at the point where we're asking an audience, especially a younger one, to just discern implicitly when the lesson is relevant to them and when it's just animals doing animal things, that's when we get into some messy territory. It's a blank space in the page that only the audience can fill in, and while there's nothing wrong with leaving some questions for the audience to answer, I think it's worth observing how the text is leading them to fill it. I don't think it's that objectionable to say that racism against black people has never really had anything to do with innate biological facts about black people, and I don't think Zootopia is saying that either. But it is using carnivores as an allegory for black people, and that is the case with carnivores. So... yeah. Considering it started life as, at varying stages, an all-animal Free Musketeers parody, a spy movie, and a film about a bounty-hunting pug in space, I'd say Zootopia's ambitions to give a nuanced perspective on racial prejudice and discrimination was a lofty and admirable one. Whether it's one that totally makes sense without inadvertently reinforcing some of the exact ideas it's trying to dispute is... disputable. There are a few other specific issues with Zootopia, such as the ways its more comedic elements revel in the exact kind of stereotyping the film's overt message is trying to combat, and the way it frames not being discriminated against as a kind of reward for good behaviour. For more on that, I'm going to recommend checking out Nick Schwartz's video focused more specifically on the film and its problems. Nick gets to be part of lawful society and doesn't feel the need to break rules anymore. Hooray! Now he gets to be treated like a person, and all he had to do was almost get killed several times in a row. Buddy, one predator, two another. Okay, last example, and this time we're gonna go back into the wild world of anime. I present to you all Ringing Bell. Ringing Bell is probably my favourite example of this sort of metaphor being executed well, and I think that's partially because of the ways it's both less explicit in what issues it's trying to tackle, 
while also being more direct in how it's tackling them. Let me explain. Chirim is a baby lamb living on a farm with his mother and a small flock of peaceful, docile sheep. He, in particular, is a naive and playful infant, wanting to explore outside the confines of the flock's field, despite constant warnings from his mother about the dangers that lurk beyond the hills. Specifically, the wolves and the wolf king, who live among the mountains. And wouldn't you know it, the wolf king eventually shows up. One night, Chirim's mother is butchered by the wolf, sending Chirim into a fit of despair and, ultimately, a desire for revenge. He seeks out the wolf, and unexpectedly, demands he be trained to become a wolf himself. In his own words, I'm sick of being a sheep, all we ever do is stand in corners and shake, I want to learn to be a scary wolf just like you are! At Chirim's constant insistence that he'll become a wolf whatever it takes, the Wolf King's initial reaction mirrors the audience's. No, he can't, because the king was born a wolf, and Chirim was born a sheep. Nonetheless, the wolf eventually takes pity on Chirim, and over the course of the next few years, he's hardened into a tough and terrifying foe rivaling even that of his mentor. The Wolf King's assumptions, and that of the audience, were wrong. Through sheer determination, Chirim is able to become every bit a wolf like his master, and ultimately get his revenge. With Chirim given his final test to reenact the events of his mother's death and ransack the same field he grew up in, he takes a stand against the wolf, killing him and ultimately protecting the flock. Far from a moment of triumph, the sheep cower in fear of what Chirim has become. They no longer recognize him as one of them, but instead another blood-crazed monster like the wolf he just killed. Chirim wanders off into the woods, a being without a place in the world. Neither the sheep he was born, nor the monster he'd become. In comparison to the other examples I've talked about today, what might immediately jump out is that this story isn't nearly as overt about the social issues it's tackling, especially as a contrast to Zootopia. Go back to the forest, predator! I'm from the savannah! The story is pretty plainly one centered around prejudice, particularly prejudice about assumptions we make about people based on their appearance and the way they were born. As I said, it's fascinating that it's the villain's viewpoint which would be the closest to the assumptions an audience would make about the idea of a sheep trying to become a wolf. It's just not possible. Animals don't work that way. And even if Chirim was an unusually strong member of the flock, it's unlikely he'd ever be able to contend with a real honed predator, and even if he could, it probably would be the result of some chance genetic lottery. And the reason the story largely ignores this, when you think about it, is pretty obvious. Because this isn't really a story about animals. It's a story about people. At least from my viewing, Ringing Bell is a story about how the environments we grow up in, as well as the choices we make, ultimately shape the kinds of people we become. In the same way the circumstances of our own births do have a strong influence in our behaviours and our worldviews, Trim being born among a docile flock of sheep does have a profound effect on him. But crucially, how he ultimately ends up does remain a choice, not bound to any fixed biological reality of his condition. Trim isn't shunned from his community because he's literally a wolf. We're plainly shown he's still a sheep like any other, albeit an especially edgy looking one. He's shunned because of his behaviours, a violent and monstrous demeanour that terrifies the peaceful flock. Almost this entire story is utter nonsense if we try to transfer it onto anything resembling real animal behaviour, but the story specifically rejects any attempt to do so. In the question of when the story is about animals and when it's about people, Ringing Bell says pretty definitively, it's all about people. The use of animal metaphor is an almost entirely aesthetic one, and it wouldn't be difficult to transplant this narrative onto a cowboy or samurai story. The original writer of Ringing Bell, Takashi Anase, was born in 1919, growing up in the midst of World War II before eventually being drafted into the Imperial Army and sent to China. With Ringing Bell, it's hard not to see the echoes of those experiences. 
In this story of innocence being suddenly and irreversibly torn from the young who should be enjoying those fleeting years of naivety. The use of sheep and wolves to illustrate this underline the message of how dramatically people can be shaped by their experiences, and how we can't entrust too much about who a person is or who they're going to be on their beginnings. Like Zootopia and Uuromasu, it demonstrates how our initial assumptions about others can be misguided. But without overstepping that line, into territory where the text might be saying a lot more than it intended. If there's one thing to take away from what we've talked about here, it's how easy it is for social or political allegory to fall into some pretty tricky territory, especially when we start making appeals to nature. So far today, I haven't felt the need to get into the storied history of animal allegory as a tool of fascist symbolism, a means to dehumanise our equals while also implicitly pushing some bafflingly ill-conceived ideas of how human biology works. And I haven't gone into it because I don't want to give the impression that there's something inherently problematic in using these metaphors and analogies. They can, as I've hopefully demonstrated today, be used well or make some missteps. And it should go without saying that none of what I've said here makes these stories I've talked about evil Nazi propaganda. This stuff is ultimately interpretive, and most of the more troubling readings of this material comes more from the absence of clarity given by the text rather than anything overtly bigoted or intolerant. In fact, I specifically chose the stories I did today because I really like them, and I find a lot of elements of their messages pretty admirable and heartwarming. But something I've always tried to do with my channel is break down narratives and the ways we craft them, and I think something unique you see in this specific type of story is a lot of ideas being communicated both by the explicit text and by what's left out. It gives us a unique and maybe sometimes uncomfortable insight into the ways our own brains work and the ways we think about things. From 1980 to 1991, Jewish cartoonist Art Spiegelman produced Mouse, a compilation of stories by his father from his time spent fleeing the Nazis during the Second World War. Illustrating this, Art chose to depict the Jews and the Nazis in the ways they were frequently depicted in propaganda, the former as mice and the latter as cats. What Art discovered was that the metaphor quickly fell apart. He would be stuck on how to depict his wife, someone who wasn't born Jewish but had converted when they'd wed, and he'd be left unsure of how to depict Germans who'd been accused of Jewish ancestry. Ultimately, Art would conclude this experience thusly. What the book is about is the commonality of human beings. It's crazy to divide things down the nationalistic or racial or religious lines. And that's the whole point, isn't it? These metaphors, which are meant to self-destruct in my book, still have a residual force that allows them to work as metaphors and still get people worked up over them. I don't think we can discount the use of animal allegory in fiction, and especially the visceral and emotional power they can hold. They allow us to capture universal experiences, as well as speak about issues that may otherwise be difficult to voice. But we also can't discount that in that power, it can be easy to communicate a lot more than we may have intended, and it's important to be critical of that both as creators and as an audience. And also, Specifically, maybe take a break from using predators as a metaphor for people of colour. <laughs> hey folks, thanks again for watching. Got a big ol' year of content ahead and hopefully this has got you primed for it. A quick reminder as always that if you like the video, please feel free to give it a like, subscribe and share it around on Reddit, Twitter or wherever else. It really helps the channel a lot. If you especially like my content, please consider throwing me a buck or two over on Patreon to be one of the names scrolling past now. You can also donate through Coffee for one-time donations. Backing me gets you in the credits scrolling by now. I'd like to give a special thanks to A Recusant, Callan Stein, Connor D, Cal Rara, Gary Marshall, George Soros, Mal Patuis, No More Worlds, and Tor in the Exile. With an extra special thanks to Charlotte Allen and Leftist Tech Support. 
If you'd like to keep up with me, feel free to follow me on Twitter at LackinSaints, or check out my regular Twitch streams at twitch.tv slash LackSaints. I'd like to give a final big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring me with this video. If you'd like to check out their service with the link in the description, do that. It's a great service and helps out the channel. Other than that, I'll see you all next time. As always, thank you all for watching, love you all, and stay safe.